Thank you, Saul. Thank you very much to the organizers for inviting me. It's my first time in Singapore. It has been a very pleasant experience so far. Yeah, I want to talk about uh, reciprocity. And um, let me start with the mother of all reciprocity laws, Gauss' law of quadratic reciprocity. was proved more than 200 years ago in Göttingen. And uh, <laughs> so you fix two primes, Q and L, odd distinct primes. And then the reciprocity law says that the uh, Legendre symbol Q over L is essentially the Legendre symbol L over Q up to a correction factor minus one to the power L minus one times Q minus one over four. Gauss called it the golden theorem. He was very proud of uh, having established the first proof. And even by modern standards, it's a, it's a difficult theorem because it's by no means obvious. It makes some connection between the field FQ and the field FL, and a priori, there is no reason why this should be true. A little later, Hilbert gave, also in Göttingen, by the way, gave a, a reformulation. If K is a global field, uh, he defined a pairing of local fields, KV star times KV star, to plus minus one, depending on whether a certain ternary quadratic form is isotropic or anisotropic. And this locally defined pairing satisfies a global consistency relation. The product over all places V, so if A and B are in K star, then this product equals one. So even though it's locally defined, they cannot be random. They have to satisfy one global consistency relation. So this holds for all A, B in K star. And this, in fact, implies quadratic reciprocity simply by picking K equal to Q, and then A is P, or A is Q, and B is L. And then at Q, you get this, and at L, you get that, and this is the factor at 2. And what you can see is that, in some sense, quadratic reciprocity is a local global, a local global principle. And still a little later, um, Artin came and, um, well, he turned tables, so if you so typically, you, you fix the field FQ, and you look at this as a function modulo Q. So the numerator, take the numerator modulo Q. But you can also fix the numerator and look at this as a function uh, of the denominator. And then if you look at, at this function for fixed L, quadratic reciprocity tells you that this function is, in fact, as a function of the denominator, is periodic, modulo L, more or less, modulo 4L. So this is a function Z modulo 4LZ star to plus minus 1. And if you're fancy, then uh, you realize plus minus 1 as the Galois group of Q square root L over Q. And Artin generalized this in the context of class field theory to arbitrary abelian extensions L over K. There is the Artin symbol L over K, which is mapped to some Galois element in the Galois group L over K. 
And this can be composed with some Galois representation rho into, say, GLNC. What's that? No, no, <laughs> he didn't. Um, Artin, Artin spent most of his life in Hamburg, uh, although he certainly visited Göttingen, but this was not proved in Göttingen. Uh, and the key point is that, so the, the key point, is, and this, that's Artin's reciprocity law, is that this map, so the kernel of this map, contains an arithmetic progression. such as the kernel of this map contains an arithmetic progression. That's art in reciprocity. Art in reciprocity. And so this arithmetic progression can be detected by a hecke grossen character, and it gives a relation um, to, to uh, L functions, GL1 L functions, and this finally leads to Langland's reciprocity. Uh, I, ideals co-prime to the conductor. Yeah. If you want fractional ideals co-prime to the conductor. Uh, unramify it. Yeah, and this leads to Langland's reciprocity um, making a, a conjectural connection between arithmetic objects, Galois representations, and automorphic L functions. And that's what this conference is all about. And um, so this is sort of a, a five-minute survey of 200 years of uh, reciprocity laws, some of them proven, some of them conjectural. Okay, what I want to present today is um, a slightly different kind of uh, reciprocity law where the field FQ is replaced by an analytic object, namely the modular curve of level Q. So replace the field FQ with the modular curve of level Q so the upper half plane modulo the congruence subgroup of level Q. And I'm interested in automorphic forms on this space. So let me denote by GL2A modulo GL2Q modulo the standard congruence subgroup of level Q. Um, the, so this is, and I also uh, um, mod out by the center, and I take automorphic forms on this space, and let me call this double y naught of Q. And the first reciprocity law that I would like to present is the following. It's joint work with Rizwan Khan. If I take an L function on this space, fourth moment of it, and I twist it by a Hecke eigenvalue at L, and I integrate this over the whole spectrum of level Q. This is, of course, not convergent, so I need to insert some sort of test function that makes this expression finite. So H is a suitable test function. Then this is roughly the same as the same expression twisted 
by the Hecker eigenvalue at Q and integrate it over automorphic forms of level L. I get an integral transform that I call H tilde. And of course, this is not really a theorem because I've, I haven't told you what that means. Um, it is, in fact, an exact equality, but things are a little more complicated. There are a few extra terms, some explicit polar terms, and as it, is, as it happens quite often in this subject, there are at ramified places there, you need some correction factors. So it's not really that L function at all places, but on, only at almost all places, um, at the places dividing Q and L, some correction factors are necessary. But in principle, this is an exact equality um, up to some extra embellishments that have to be inserted. All right, and the reciprocity is obvious. Q and L just change their places. And again, it's, it's a, a result that's not, it's not a priori clear that this should hold. Why should automorphic forms of level Q why should they know anything about automorphic forms of level L? What's that? Um, what do you mean, how is it normalized? Oh yeah, right. You mean this one? Yes, yes. So, so lambda pi of one is one. Um, well, I, I think Hecker eigenvalues are, are, are God given. I mean, uh, but, but I mean, you, you could ask, okay, you can multiply this maybe by a power of L here. Um, but I mean, I haven't told you how, I mean, I haven't told you how this is normalized. But, but this is, is not essential. Okay, so maybe you have some questions, like how is it proved? What is what? The level of pi. The level of pi is Q, and the level of pi here is L. H tilde, I'm not going to tell you what it is. It's an integral transform. It involves a hypergeometric 4F3. You don't want to see it. Um, but it's, a, it's, it's an explicit integral transform, so H is a sufficiently nice test function, and H tilde is some integral transform. Right, then what is it good for? Hmm? <sighs> kind of. I mean, like it's, it's an integral transform, um, but a, a very complicated one. And what is the general picture? I mean, this is a special case somehow, so what, what is the general picture? I won't give detailed answers for any of these three questions, <laughs> but I'll, I'll give some, some hints. All right, maybe first, how is it proved? Um, I give you the proof that we came up with. Um, probably there are different proofs, and I will comment on this later. Uh, but let me first give you a sketch of the proof uh, in the spirit of analytic number theory. Don't worry, it won't be too technical. I'll, I'll skip all technicalities but I'll outline some steps of the proof. Okay, the first observation is, I mean, you may ask what's the significance of the number four here? Why the fourth moment? And um, yeah, so first of all, let me write the fourth moment as a rankin selber convolution of pi times an Eisenstein series on GL4. And it's convenient to decompose this as follows. It's L1 half pi times L1 half pi times an Eisenstein series on GL3. And this is really the way I view this. 
So then next, we integrate over pi using a trace formula, Kuznetsov formula. Having applied the trace formula, all information on pi is gone because I've integrated over pi, only E3 is left. And I apply the functional equation for E3. And at this point, algebraic exponential sums come up. This is where analytic number theory enters. We get various sums, a sum over n, a sum over C and a sum over D. C and D are co-prime, and C is divisible by Q, D is divisible by L. Q and L are these two numbers. And there is lots of stuff, but the key point is that we have an e to the 2 pi i n d bar over c. d bar is the multiplicative inverse with respect to c. And now comes reciprocity, and the reciprocity is a total triviality. It's the Chinese remainder theorem. which tells you that d bar over c is minus c bar over d plus 1 over c d. And if we, for a moment, if we ignore this 1 over c d, then you can just interchange c and d, which means you can just interchange q and l. And at this point, you just revert all steps, go back, and get your reciprocity law. Now, this is cheated a bit because there is a 1 over CD here. But this 1 over CD carries no arithmetic information. There is no bar anymore. There is no multiplicative inverse. This can be viewed entirely as an, as a not, as a, as an Archimedean weight function, as something that happens at the Archimedean place. And this is responsible for the transform H tilde. So basically, you interchange C and D, which means you interchange Q and L, and the price you have to pay is you move some of the information into the Archimedean place. And that's the local global principle that I talked about earlier. Um, there is a trade between the places L, Q, and infinity. And you can kind of move, you can interchange information between L and Q if you also modify the place infinity. That's what's happening. And at this point, you revert all steps, and you're done. All right, if you look at this, you realize it has absolutely nothing to do with the fact that this is an Eisenstein series. This could just be any form on GL3. It also has nothing to do with the fact that this is the point 1 half. It could just be any point. And so there is a much more general version of this. General version. fix some capital pi on GL3, and then there is a reciprocity law for Ls pi and Lw pi times capital pi, which, so where little pi is of level Q and you twist it by a Hecke eigenvalue at L, and then you have a reciprocity formula. All right, what is this good for? Uh, 
what, what's sorry, what's that? Um, in principle, yes. I'll give an application. Uh, so I'll, I'll give a version where this H and this H tilde plays a more prominent role later. For the moment, I would like to focus on Q and L. But yes, this is like a, a Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Uh, if you localize here, you have little control here. And if you spread out on this side, you can localize on the other side. But you can't localize too much, of course. If you, if you localize too much, then the other side will simply explode. Yeah, applications. Um, yeah, what are analytic number theorists interested in if they see L functions? They want to prove subconvexity and non-vanishing. And it's just the same kind of application as for the standard for, for Gauss's reciprocity law. What do you use the reciprocity law for? You compute Legendre symbols. And so we use this to compute L functions. And um, so one application is a subconvexity bound If pi is of level q, you can bound the central value by q to this exponent, which may not raise too much excitement in this audience. Um, but um, anyway, so the previous bound was 0.222. This one is 0.207. Um, anyway, you don't need to find this exciting, but uh, uh, in the analytic number theory community, it uh, may raise some excitement. Uh, so that would be subconvexity. What you can also do is simultaneous non-vanishing. I swept the polar terms under the carpet, but they are in terms of quantity, so in terms of order of magnitude, they are in fact the, the dominating terms. And you can get an asymptotic formula uh, for this kind of quantity, and once you have an asymptotic formula, it's impossible that all of the terms are zero. And this tells you that if you fix some capital pi on GL3, then there exists some little pi of level Q. So you fix a large level Q such that simultaneously L1 half pi is non-zero and L1 half pi times capital pi. All right. Um, so what is the general picture? Um, I mean, OK, this is a proof, but uh, you may or may not find this kind of proof satisfying. Um, is there maybe a more conceptual way? Uh, no, capital Pi can be anything, um, but in our application it's unramified, but doesn't need to be self-dual. So, not necessarily self-dual. It may be self-dual, but it doesn't have to. Uh, but we assume it's unramified. Okay, what is, what is the general picture? And to be honest, I don't know. Um, at the moment, we have a couple of examples. I showed you one. And um, I would like, so historically, the first sort of reciprocity formula that relates two different families of L functions, to my knowledge, is due to Motohashi. And that's this, maybe the simplest reciprocity formula that I would like to show you, just so that you get a feeling of uh, like what these kind of formulas could look like. This is a lower dimensional version. And that's U to Motohashi. In the 90s. And he was interested in the Riemann zeta function, the mother of all L functions. And he took the Riemann zeta function on the critical line, 1 half plus it, a fourth moment, and integrated 
this over the real line, so over the, the critical line, against some test function. And he got a beautiful identity, which really is an identity up to some extra polar terms and some maybe some correction factors. He got a spectral decomposition, automorphic forms of level one, L one half pi cubed times some integral transform, which involves a hypergeometric two F one. And that's his formula. So the fourth moment of the Riemann zeta function is related to a cubic moment of automorphic L functions on GL2. And he gave several proofs all in the spirit of analytic number theory. So there are several classical proofs, classical in the sense of analytic number theory. And Michel and Venkatesh gave, had an idea for a different proof. And this proof goes as follows. It's not really a proof. It's more, a, more an idea. But it probably it can be made rigorous. And the first idea is to say that the second moment of the Riemann zeta function is really an L function attached to an Eisenstein series on GL2. And then what the fourth moment really is, let me skip the weight function. Oh, no, okay. So, and next they chose a very specific weight function. Namely, so all my L's are L functions without the Archimedean factor. And they choose H to be the Archimedean factor, so this would be L infinity of one half plus I T squared, probably. And then the fourth moment is the completed L function, which I typically denote by lambda, one half plus I T squared. And so this is the second moment of an L function integrated over the critical line. And by Hecke's integral representation and Parseval, this is the same as integrating the Eisenstein series over the imaginary axis. But now, we can spectrally decompose this. So by the way, none of this converges. Um, but let's, let's, don't, let's not worry about that. Um, so we have an integral over y. And we spectrally decompose this square. So that's an integral over the Fourier coefficients. So we take, we take uh, the spherical vector phi in each representation. And integrate this over all pi. But by rankin selberg theory, we know very well what this triple product is. is. It's phi times an Eisenstein series times another Eisenstein series. So it's the L function of phi times the Eisenstein series, which is simply the second moment of L one half pi. So this is rankin selberg theory. And using Hecke's 
Integral representation, again, we can, in, we can ex explicitly compute the y integral, which gives us a third L1 half pi. So this equals integral L1 half pi cubed. So that's it. So it uses this integral representation, it uses Parseval, it uses spectral decomposition and rankin selberg theory. And it's not a proof because none of this converges. Not a single integral of, of what I wrote down converges. But let's not be too stingy about convergence. Um, in any case, um, so this needs to be regularized, which can probably be done. And then there is a second problem. Uh, this works very nicely if I choose this particular test function h. If I choose a different test function h, then I cannot work with the spherical phi, but I have to work with a different phi. And it's highly unclear what this h tilde becomes when I start with an arbitrary h. So the connection between h and h tilde, at least to me, is not at all clear in this procedure. There is some connection, but what it is is, is not clear, whereas Motohashi has a brutally explicit formula what h tilde is. So there are two problems. The first one is make this explicit. The second one is make it true, uh, uh, which means make it convergent. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in, in, so they get simply the completed. So if you work with the completed L function here, you get the completed L function here. Um, but if you choose something different here, you get something different there, and then it's not clear what it is. But completed L function goes into completed L function. So, problems are convergence and behavior of test functions. But in any case, this gives, at least in principle, a proof that doesn't use any trace formula. It just uses spectral decomposition at this point, but that's all. Otherwise, it's in some sense completely soft. And it's conceivable that also for the higher dimensional reciprocity laws, there is an approach of this type. Um, and in some, sense, in some cases, this can in fact be, can be established, it can be worked out. And um, the Hecke eigenvalues uh, can be represented by double cosets. And if you, if you do some clever combinatorics with double cosets, it's possible, um, at least in some cases, uh, to give a proof along these lines. All right. Um, yeah, let me maybe give um, another version of, uh, of the reciprocity law. Uh, and one thing that, uh, so one defect of this reciprocity law is that I still have to split the L function. I don't, I mean, I don't have to take four factors. It's okay to take two factors, but still I would love to have a formula that really is a GL2 times GL4 convolution and not GL2 times GL3 times an extra factor. So I don't want to have an isobaric sum. I would like to have a primitive uh, L function. And under certain circumstances, I can get this, and this is the second version. And that's joint work with Steve Miller and Zhao Jingli. And here we fix pi on GL4. Again, not necessarily self-dual, it can be anything. But we assume it to be unramified. Uh, 
and I integrate over forms of level one, L one half pi times capital pi. This is now a GL2 times GL4 convolution, weighted by a test function to make this convergent. And the key point is, we don't twist it by a Hecker eigenvalue, we twist it by the root number. I call this epsilon pi. This is the root number, plus minus one. And again, up to some noise, there is an equality that relates this to the same thing. where pi is replaced by pi tilde. There is some integral transform and again the root number. And um, of course this would be a trivial statement if h equals h tilde, but h tilde is really a different uh, function and here you get precisely the kind of localization that you would expect. Um, if you localize here, it spreads out here, and if it spreads out here, it localizes here. What's that? Uh, epsilon pi. So this is, again, the root number. I'm not sure what the significance of the root number is. It turns out that it makes the whole thing work. I don't know how to establish this without the root number. Intuitively, I would guess root numbers are difficult objects. They are not, not easy to describe. Intuitively, I would guess inserting the root number makes things harder. For some reason, it makes things easier in this case. I don't know why. Um, but with the root number, I can prove this. And um, now the question may be even more obvious, what is this good for? Uh, okay, there is an identity, but what does this identity mean? And um, so let me give you an application for this. Uh, correct. Yeah, it's, it's the root number of little pi. Yeah. But even for little pi, even on GL2, root numbers are, are complicated objects. I mean... So this formula holds regardless whether capital Pi is self-dual or not. But for my application, let's suppose that capital Pi is self-dual. So suppose Pi is self-dual. And if you have a self-dual form, it should come from, it should be a lift. And um, there are various cases. It could be a Rankine-Selberg lift, GL2 times GL2. It could be a sum cube lift, from GL2, or it could be a lift from SP4. Or what is roughly the same, O32. Maybe there are other cases, but um, these are certainly cases where you get a, a capital Pi on GL4 that's self-dual. And um, what this implies is a non-vanishing statement of the following kind. Then there exists a little pi. In fact, there exist infinitely many little pies. And we can even make this quantitative. There exist infinitely many little pi 
such that the central value of this twist doesn't vanish. We heard yesterday about non-vanishing theorems of this, of this kind. And um, at least from an analytic point of view, GL4 has always been a barrier. Uh, there are several results in the literature for, for non-vanishing of such uh, uh, rankin selber convolutions with GL2, uh, maybe GL3. But GL4 so far has been a barrier, even for Dirichlet characters. So you may ask, fix GL, pi on GL4, is there a Dirichlet character such that this doesn't vanish? And um, the analytic number theory community tried this for a long time, and we failed by an epsilon, but that's enough. Um, so this is, for instance, unknown. And um, to my knowledge, any other non-vanishing statement that involves a GL4 guy, and you want to find infinitely many, so some, some family where this doesn't vanish is unknown. So this is the first of its kind. And um, I would like to show you how this follows from the reciprocity law. So here the reciprocity is of somewhat different nature. The space is the same, but the depth of the spectrum is different. Here, for instance, I can take a very small piece of the spectrum, and on the other side, I get a very big piece of the spectrum, or the other way around. So the reciprocity is in terms of sort of the depth of the spectrum. OK, so how could you possibly get uh, a non-vanishing result from something like this? Because somehow this seems a very unnatural object because of the root number. The root number oscillates. I mean, this could easily be 0 all the times, and this could easily be 0 all the time. And um, simply because, I mean, there is there's so much oscillation, it's not clear how you can deduce anything from this. But it's possible in the following way. Here's the proof. So first of all, we take a test function that's roughly a characteristic function on a long interval. So if you, and also, I distinguish between the cuspidal spectrum and the Eisenstein spectrum. So I first look at the cuspidal spectrum, where pi infinity goes up to capital X, L1 half pi times capital pi times the root number, and then I have the Eisenstein spectrum. And if I evaluate this using the reciprocity formula, I can show that this is bounded by capital X. So this follows from the reciprocity formula. OK, so far so good. This means nothing because, uh, first of all, I don't know what the Eisenstein term is, and secondly, this is a, an, I mean, even though this is non-negative, uh, this oscillates. But now comes the second part of the proof. And the second part of the proof is a lower bound for the Eisenstein contribution. And this can be done by a method that goes back to Rudnick and Sound. And using this method, one can show that the Eisenstein contribution is bounded from below by x log x. Aha. This guy is at least x log x, but the sum of the two is at most x. If all of these guys were 0, well, you would immediately arrive at the contradiction that x log x is smaller than x, which is not true. So there must be some big contribution that kind of cancels this x log x term so that the sum is only of size x, and that's the proof. Uh, ha -ha. You mean on that side? Ah, the key point is that if this spreads out, then 
H tilde decays immediately. So you basically get just one term on this side. Um, so H, so for this test, test function, which is of course not this test function, but a smooth version of it, but that's, that's obvious, then this H tilde of pi infinity will be bounded by one plus pi infinity to the minus A. So you basically just pick up the first few terms and then, then you can bound them trivially. So you don't need any fancy assumption. It's just that on this side, you, well, it's times x, of course, because that's the, that's the length. Ah, uh, wait a moment, maybe this is a, yeah, you have to, okay, you have to normalize this properly. So um, it means that these are x terms, uh, yeah. So you don't need any fancy bounds, you just need, on, on the L function, you just need a bound on H tilde, which is not so easy because the integral transform going from here to here really involves a hypergeometric 4F3. Um, and so it requires some work to analyze this, but it behaves in the way it should behave if you have a, a long, it's like a Fourier transform in this sense, if you have a long interval here, you get a very localized version here. Um, and so once you know this, this bound is essentially trivial. Right, and then you apply the machinery of Rudnick and Sound, showing that the Eisenstein contribution is bounded from below by x log x. And this is the point where you need self-duality. Because you need positivity of the Eisenstein contribution, and this is, so this is the only point where self-duality enters, but this is, of course, crucial. Okay, and this is, this proves uh, this non-vanishing statement. Yeah, so that's uh, basically what I wanted to tell you. Um, what I would like to know is, again, is there, like, what is the bigger picture? I mean, I've given you several examples of reciprocity laws um, relating various families of L functions that a priori shouldn't know anything about each other, but apparently they do. Um, are there more uh, families of this kind? I don't know. Perhaps yes, perhaps no, perhaps for other groups, groups of higher rank, orthogonal groups, symplectic groups. I don't know. This remains to be explored. And maybe there's a kind of master formula that sort of includes all of these examples. I don't know. That's something that needs to be explored. Thank you very much. Yeah, that's a, that's a proof. Well, so this statement is, is proved in this way. Yeah, that, that's the proof for this statement. And that, that's a rigorous proof. I mean, this is, of course, a short version of it. But that's a, that's a theorem. Well, all little pi's are self-dual um, because I have trivial, cent trivial central character. No, no, it takes, tells you that there are infinitely many pi's with epsilon pi equal to minus one. Because this is positive, so you need a negative contribution, and this is non-negative, so this can only happen, uh, so. So the minus one guys, I mean, maybe there are also infinitely many non-vanishing with plus one, but the proof tells you that there are infinitely many with, with epsilon pi equal to minus one. It's very odd, yeah, odd, odd in, the, in, the, in, a, in a strong sense, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, in some sense it's not so odd because Eisenstein series are even. And um, the counterpart is that you need the odd mass forms to compensate the even Eisenstein series. Because in the in the cusp in, in the in the in the, in the um, continuous part, there is nothing odd, so somehow there must be more odd in the cuspidal part. That's kind of the philosophy. Okay, 
This, uh, it, it does use the Voronoi summation formula in the proof because at some point you have to dualize this capital pi. Uh, so you use Voronoi summation on GL4 or the functional equation for this capital pi. It's also an application of, of the Kuznetsov formula because the spectral sum is, uh, is um, carried out by the Kuznetsov formula. So basically what you do is you use the Kuznetsov formula here, then you dualize and you use Kuznetsov backwards. And just to be a bit technical, because you asked for it, um, the key point is that the inclusion of the root number, um, so because the root number is included, you use the opposite sign Kuznetsov formula, which involves a Bessel K function rather than a Bessel J function. And if the root number was not included, then you get a Bessel J function and everything is completely involutory. I mean, you can run the same argument, but you get an identity one equals one. Um, but if you include the root number, you get a Bessel K function, which behaves very different. Um, and it breaks, it breaks the sort of uh, self-dual cycle and um, it, it gives you a non-trivial formula. Yeah? So from a technical point of view, this root number uh, makes it possible to use a sort of different version of the Kuznetsov formula that gives you finally a non-trivial formula. So that's that's a technical explanation. Um, it probably works in the same way, except that we haven't worked it out. Um, this this should not be this should not be essential, um, but uh, it would just be more technical. Yeah. Um, it could have ramification at any place, uh, finite or infinite, um, but in order to keep it reasonably simple, we have made this assumption, but it's certainly not essential. Not that I know of. Um, yeah, not that I know of. Oh, oh, it's certainly, it's, it must be, it's certainly true, but it, I mean, we can't prove it. Well, nobody knows the proof. Uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, what, what, what would you, okay. Um, I can only tell you what, anal what an analytic number theorist would do. And, um, Oh, just any character, any, like, so, so suppose you, okay, so, I mean, here, okay, so suppose you take, um, yeah, so what would you do? So the method of analytic number theory is you just sum up enough terms and hope you get an asymptotic formula. So what you could do is you just sum over all characters mod Q, and then let's just sum over all Q up to capital Q, sum over everything you have, and, then look at one half chi times capital pi. Okay, and hope, so what should this be? This should probably be Q squared, because you have Q squared terms plus O of something, times a constant. That's what you would hope. Um, and we don't know how to establish this. I mean, again, an analytic number theorist would maybe use an approximate functional equation for this, just so you can write this as a finite sum, chi of n times lambda capital pi of n over n to the one half plus a root number term, then you would try to use orthogonality of characters, try to sum this up, but the error terms explode. Um, they are just too big. And we can do this on GL3. That's a result by Luo. And he tried hard to do it on GL4. And what is possible is to do this at a point S that's off the critical line. But as soon as you hit the critical line, you die. Um, it doesn't work. Uh, and in fact, you can do this on, on GLN, but then you have to go even further away from the critical line. So if you're close enough to the one line, you can do it for any GLN. But if you really want to hit the critical line, the limit is GL3. So it was, for us at least, quite remarkable that in this situation we could hit GL4 on the critical line. 